Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. Hey, I know we took a surprise week off. I'm sorry, but I needed some extra time. I was kind of busy at work. I got a million excuses. I hit my foot. (laughs) The bathtub was too cold. I had to send letters to my parents. I had to pay my bills. I have a million excuses. This one's on me, though. I'll just say up front. Sorry about missing a surprise week, uh, but we're back and we're back with a Yakuza episode of Miami Vice. And this means Castillo with the ninja. No Speedo, though. <laughs> I'm I'm kind of disappointed. There was no Speedo and no long haired Castillo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well, this episode is titled is season four, episode nine, titled Rising Sun of Death. It originally premiered on December 4th, 1987. It is written by Peter Lance, who also has three more episodes coming. He is also a story editor for 10 episodes on this season, too. Something about season four, like lots of people were on season four, did a lot of work on season four, but none of them are listed for doing stuff in season five. Well, that should tell you right there. (laughs) (laughs) They were so successful, they never had to appear again. (laughs) <laughs> we don't need you anymore. You've done enough for the show. <laughs> it is directed by Leon Chasso. That name sounds very familiar because he's also done some of our favorite episodes, as in favorite awkward episodes in Little Miss Dangerous, Kill Shot, Better Living Through Chemistry, and he's still got one more to go. Hey, Kill Shot's not awkward. That one's good. Except for the acting. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> except for hiring real high ally players to be in well, it. Well, not any more awkward than real basketball players to be in it. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get started, to check in and see what's going on in each other's lives, guys, we mentioned it a few weeks ago that Roseanne was coming back. Actually, it was a few months ago. It's here. Roseanne came back. They're doing a limited run. Essentially, the entire cast came back, plus both Beckys, and it yep. blew up. Over 14 million views, viewers on the first episode. I read 18 million yeah, it on was, the first. It was huge. Yeah, 18 million, 18 two or something. It was so huge that they immediately announced that they signed them for season two. Yep, the very next day it was announced that they were signed for season two. Yep, that's crazy. Yeah, they're also double running the episode. So they're running them at the normal time slot and then they're running them again, uh, I believe, on the weekends. That is crazy because the benefit to broadcasts or like cable TV in the era of the DVR is like the Game of Thrones effect where it is you have to watch it that night. That way you can talk about it the next day. But it's interesting that they double run it over the weekend. But like you could just DVR it and then watch it. I guess one thing to say is that there's that many people that don't have cable that they'll catch it on their antenna. Maybe, but or also it's like the people that are watching it are old school TV watchers, like our parents. I you know, actually saw something about that. Roseanne did really well in the the. The, like the top five places it did really well was all like right in the middle of the country, Kansas City, mm-hmm. uh, Indiana, like right in the middle of the country. So, yeah, maybe it is. Maybe it does have to do with people and antennas. You just think <laughs> that they would partner up or like it's ABC, right? So ABC is Disney and Disney owns the majority share of Hulu. So they just put it immediately available on Hulu. Yeah, but those people in those rural areas are not going to have Hulu. That, but that's who they're trying to go they for. They barely have an antenna. That's what I'm saying, yeah. <laughs> they're not going to have it. That, that, that's who they're trying to get with this, right? I know, Melissa, you're a huge Roseanne <laughs> fan. I, I know you're staying out of like any reviews, anything. I'm paying attention to it. Like, hey, I love Roseanne. I'm going to go watch it when I want to watch it and just go into it like, I love Roseanne. But also not being able to escape in the internet era. It's that hard. We're, we're all <laughs> collectively remembering that Roseanne is kind of crazy. Yeah, and I just have to remember that Roseanne was crazy when the first the first iteration of it was on, and I loved it then. So I'm trying to remember that. It's hard though, but I w- I am going to watch it. I have not. I did not watch the new one just because I I'm not going to just watch something on the night it comes out. I can't watch it on a Tuesday at nine o'clock or whatever. It just didn't work out for me. Um, but I will watch it eventually. Which is funny because we are the antenna people too. Like we we're gonna have to. The re-airing actually helps us. <laughs> yeah, I know. Actually, when he said it was here, I'm like, well, cool, I can watch it on like a Saturday then because I can't watch it on a Tuesday because I got kids to put to bed and, you know. Or... I actually happened to catch it 
when it was on on Tuesday at 9, just flipping through the channels. And so I actually watched it live. It was Roseanne, you know, and I, I enjoyed it. At the time I watched it, I, I think a little bit of what you're talking about, Melissa, is like at the time I watched it, it made sense that it would make her character like a Trump supporter because they fit that kind of where they lived in the country and what their characters portray. And then afterwards, I saw some stuff that she was posting on uh, social media. And I was like, oh, yeah, she's kind of crazy. Yeah, she's <laughs> and it was like, like this realization, like, yeah, these people are a lot different than they were when they were making that. Or at least my perception of them is different than when I watched the original series. Well, this episode of Miami Vice and Roseanne being back, it's just a reminder that as we talk about this episode, that the 80s is back. I saw Ready Player One over the weekend. Roseanne is back. Miami Vice is due for a reboot. Like. The 80s are back, people, except for the music. No, I know. <laughs> We're going backwards on the music <laughs> part. <laughs> Old people, these young whippersnappers and their music is terrible. <laughs> Let's go break down this week's episode. There's Morrissey when you need. <laughs> exactly. Be careful, John. You know I'm a huge Morrissey fan. <laughs> All right, so we open up and I have a question right as soon as we open. Where is it in Miami where they just have shit on fire and a limo drives through the fire? Don't you even try and hide your criminal activity? Or is it like just a beacon to, sh to, to funnel people down to this side of town? So it's just a side of – it's just like the wire, but it's just a side of town where well, the yes. Miami police are like, this is just the way it is over there. We don't go over there. Don't go by the burning <laughs> – barrels and also there's always a car on fire whose car is that no one sees that in the distance like should we check out that fire over there with the car no i just really appreciate that the criminals feel like they need to add some flair to their activity and no one ever investigates them no it's very mad max right like this like a like row of leading up to it but then when they get inside the building it's like super fancy with a spa <laughs> and stuff what yeah <laughs> I, I was blown away by this place. I mean, so at first they're having this, you know, really nice like tea party. <laughs> yeah, um, with sushi. And, and then the restaurant doubles as a massage parlor. There's like a bar. The I didn't strippers. stand karaoke, but they had hot tubs. I mean, what restaurant has hot tubs? <laughs> the ones that have strippers, dancers. It opens like fire and brimstone. Bum, yes, bum, very bum. ominous. They walk into this weird looking warehouse way out on the outskirts of town and inside it's strippers and hot tubs and bar and music <laughs> and they're like having they're having a great dinner it's like oh i can't eat anymore it's like no please have more like yeah have some more sake here you go <laughs> some very uh, confusing mixed messages open <laughs> tea party consisting of a rich white guy and our and our crime boss for this episode, Ryoshi Tanaka, played by James Hong. James Hong, man, he's had a 50-year career in over 300 credited roles. It's just been all over the place. I mean, movies like Blade Runner, Trouble in Little China, China Girl, all kinds of TV. His first role was in 55 uh, in the movie Soldier of Fortune. He was one of the uh, voiceover actors in the uh, like old school Godzilla movie. Damn. Oh, now we're like. <laughs> <laughs> so they're whining and dining this guy, Avery. He's having a great time. He gets really drunk. Yeah, he's like, I've had, I've had a little too much to drink already. They're like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Keep pouring it. They take him out of the club. He sees some strippers. He goes to the hot tub. They're rubbing all over him. And he's like, oh, marvelous. Oh, God, it was gross. Oh, this is fantastic. That was the worst part because <laughs> if we didn't have subtitles on, we would never know what he was actually saying. You'd hear him in the background. But he was like, oh, this is nice. You're very good at that. <laughs> it's so creepy. <laughs> marvelous. Ooh. <laughs> God. <laughs> the doors slide open from behind him while he's in the hot tub and a man comes out the ladies see their cue to leave and he the man agawa as we find out later grabs avery shoves him under the water and we go to the opening credits <laughs> what a way to die like, and he yeah, thought so it was a girl at first too it's like damn that's a little hard honey <laughs> slow down back there <laughs> yeah that's terrible man I mean, being drowned in a hot tub do you know how dirty that water is <laughs> Oh, it's basically just drowned in man gravy. Yeah, because it's at a strip club. There's nothing but sperm in that thing. It's all jammed up in there. 
When we come back from the opening credits, it's Sunny and Caitlin, our only Caitlin appearance in this no, episode. Whatever. It's actually very limited, very limited well, thank Sunny, God too. for that, at least. Oh. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> it means limited Caitlin. <laughs> They're going well, I mean, shopping. we also get also get to hear her talking on the phone. And oh, she, that's true. He calls her know, one time. And she doesn't know that how to keep his... She's trying to get him killed. She, <laughs> op- she answers the, his undercover line as, uh, uh, Sunny Crockett Burnett. I don't know. Who is it? <laughs> 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 he's trying to murder him <laughs> and he says right here too he's like be, anything we buy that's gonna be public it has to be in the name burnett because i have a uh, profile i yeah. have to keep because he's so well at that so far also he can't afford that yeah. house so. <laughs> <laughs> i love he's how kidding, he's right? complaining about it they're house shopping and they're looking at a house that is a smoking deal at eight hundred and seventy five thousand dollars, and he's complaining like he's the one that's gonna pay for it when he's got the rich wife well that's what he said he goes i can contribute like 450 dollars a month towards it <laughs> <laughs> and he and the house is actually 1.2 million but she said she thinks they can get it for a smoking deal of eight seventy five because it's some businessman, some mm-hmm. drug dealer who's going to jail. What gets me too is that at the end of the scene, she's asking like, "How do you want to decorate the house?" And what's Sunny got against Japanese? I know he's such a racist in this episode. <laughs> <laughs> he's like anything but Japanese. Yeah, like that king. We haven't even, they have he hasn't even gotten the case yet. And so he has no reason to even connect it to the Yakuza. That's just, a, that's just out of left field. Like, like it's anything but Japanese. I also think that's a personal cut at Castillo. I don't want to look like Castillo's house. <laughs> to break this up in the house shopping, Sunny gets a call from Tubbs, says we got a floater. So we go out to the waterfront and tell and Crockett find the floater. And Sunny says, like what we always wonder, why doesn't Homicide handle this? We never do floaters. It's like, how many floaters have you handled, first of all? <laughs> Since we've watched the show, there's been plenty of floaters. And they're all your witnesses that you were supposed to protect. And one of them was his girlfriend that was, that was doing the betting. <laughs> uh, it must that makes them an expert. Oh. <laughs> exactly. That's why they called you in. You're king of the floaters. <laughs> no, I, I, I just think Hamas must be so bad at their job that they're like, no, 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 no. This one's going to vice. This one's important. Well, I mean, they do prove it, right? When they bring in the actual homicide guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is Avery that they found. He had a venture in Port Lauderdale. And the vice team actually knew that he was mixed up somehow with the Yakuza. Well, just just Castillo, not anyone else. <laughs> he explains to them, like, this is why it's ours. And then I love Castillo. I love Castillo to this whole thing because whenever he's like the Yakuza, he's like, not my backyard. Yeah. He, <laughs> <laughs> he first thing he didn't call it the Yakuza. He calls it the Yakuza. <laughs> and then he's like, and, and, and I don't want them in my city. That's all. Like, I don't want them here. <laughs> I got this feeling from Castillo. Every time he said, like, some kind of fact about the Yakuza, he got this almost, like, smug look on his face. <laughs> like, yeah, that's right. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> all that time studying the Yakuza is paying off. <laughs> <laughs> they head back over to the precinct, and the press wants answers. They're talking to Vasquez, who's, a, like, an assistant to the mayor. And he's also got Detective Haskell with him, who's from Homicide. They go in and talk to Castillo. They want Castillo to give him info, but Castillo's like, I don't have anything yet. We just started our investigation. And they really try and pressure him. Like, just give us something. We get, we get the press off us because it's election season for the mayor. So we kind of want answers. Before, and Castillo's like, I don't give a shit. And yeah, he the, just leaves. Yeah, the guy from Homicide tried to threaten him. He's like, you know, so you're going to tell me what you know. He's like, I don't know anything. And just walks away. <laughs> I'm not scared of you. <laughs> so Vasquez, Haskell, and Castillo all head down to the coroner where Sonny's just hanging out. Like, he's just he's well, there so, so often. Tubbs was there. He was just real quiet in that, in that scene. <laughs> the coroner says that this man didn't drown in salt water. He drowned in fresh water. That's how you can prove that he didn't wasn't drunk and just fell off a boat or something, which is what Haskell was suggesting from the very beginning, that he drowned somewhere else and then the body was dumped in salt water. Haskell tries yeah, really ha- hard. Has- yeah, Haskell's really trying the whole nothing to see here. Oh, fresh water? Oh, he must have fallen in the pool. And then floated uh, out of it. <laughs> floated out of the pool into a river, down through Florida, <laughs> through the Everglades, and into the ocean. <laughs> So they kick Haskell out, and he goes out into the hallway, and then he goes and like eyeballs Trudy God, while she's such on a the perv. phone. Yeah, 
And Sonny says inside with the coroner, he's like, he wasn't wearing many clothes. There's something, there really is something wrong here. He also he was also wearing a $15,000 watch that's missing. So he was robbed and he wasn't wearing many clothes and his lungs are full of hot tub water. There's something wrong in here. <laughs> They're full of sperm. You can say it. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Also, the watch was from his wife. It was it was a wedding present he never, or an Irish person, present he never took off. His wife, did his wife know that he was over there? hooking it up <laughs> oh, <laughs> in the hot tub <laughs> so so for one the medical examiner just wasn't having it he was like no this guy was cooked in some man gravy <laughs> like <laughs> he was poached <laughs> like quit pl- quit playing and, and then the whole thing with the watch like you have to think like haskell's gonna gotta leave thinking like man Someone's getting fired. Like, who who would take the watch off the guy after you murder him? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he knows inside that gang. Someone's not keeping a finger. Yep. <laughs> uh-huh. Let's hope it's a guy who has all 10, at least. <laughs> Detective Sergeant Ernest Haskell, played by R. Lee Ermy. Most famous for being the drill sergeant in Full Metal Jacket. It's really obvious it's him also with his hair dyed. <laughs> yeah i was like oh my god is that him and with black hair why does he look so normal <laughs> <laughs> ermy actually funny about that role he was only hired as a technical advisor on full metal jacket but they liked him so much they actually gave him the role as the drill instructor he was so good convincing as a drill sergeant because he was actually a retired u.s marine corps drill instructor he served from 71 to 72 was a drill sergeant from 65 to 67. He served 14 months in Vietnam. After he was discharged from the military, he started acting, pretty much consistently playing the military guy. Uh, his first movie was The Boys in Company C. He had an appearance in Apocalypse Now. He was a technical advisor on An Officer and a Gentleman. And then after Full Metal Jacket, he just blew up. I mean, he even did some voice acting uh, later in his career. And he also started doing a lot of TV appearances. Castillo was able to successfully tell Vasquez, like, we need to investigate this, and Haskell ain't welcome back in here for at least 48 hours because we see something wrong here i don't know about you but this is pretty obvious yeah why would he <laughs> i don't understand why he wouldn't be skeptical of of haskell wanting to get like pushed under the rug right away vasquez like why isn't he like because yeah. he just wants it to go away because of the don't the press, worry i guess <laughs> they never take this subplot seriously and it just kind of disappears <laughs> well, never gonna go anywhere. <laughs> through the episode <laughs> upstairs the duo pull a file on tanaka the our main crime boss here and he was in world war ii he's a war criminal he's known with the police and interpol he's just known as being a problem castillo sends the duo yeah, well, off to hold on they, they are also talking back and forth about the case and i want to point out that sunny says how he was drowned in a japanese hot tub how does he know it was a Japanese hot tub? He's racist. That guy's Japanese. He's like, like, Suspect's Japanese. Must this, be his hot tub. This whole episode is full of little nuggets like that. We got one that's going to come up right now because Castillo sends the duo off to go investigate Avery's office because apparently you can just do that like in the middle of the night. Right? Yeah, I thought that was weird they left in the middle of the night. Like, how'd they know if that guard was even going to be there like to get in? Like, what? I don't know. But they say go <laughs> investigate his office to see if there's any connections to Tanaka or to the Yakuza. So they head over to Avery's office, and there's two men already inside of there. Ransacking the place. <laughs> yeah, they're going through everything. They get into a safe. The duo show up, and they go inside and flash their badge to the security guard who's been killed. And they see on the screens that a bunch of men come running out of a- an elevator and into a car and drive away really fast. And Sonny says, something hinky is happening in the garage. <laughs> <laughs> The duo run to their car, but meanwhile, another man, as we find out later, his name is Fujitsu, left his business card underneath Sonny's windshield wipers. Windshield wipers. <laughs> they jump into the Porsche. They go chasing after. Sonny says, quote, these guys don't drive Japanese. <laughs> what the hell did that yeah. mean? What the hell, what Crockett? What does that even mean? <laughs> I'm pretty sure it what means. What does he got against Japanese? <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure he means that they weren't driving slow, that they were driving I, fast, I like still, the stereotype about Asian people and driving slow. I just don't know. I still think maybe it was like they're not driving a Japanese car because then Tub make, makes 
a comment about the dollar, the the value of a dollar. So he that's says why there I thought, must like, be a drop in the dollar. Sorry, there must be a drop in the dollar. That's what I'm saying. Like I think he was saying like they're not driving a Japanese car. Yeah, I don't know though. That was the only really thing I can think of. Racist. Yeah, it still sounds racist, <laughs> especially <laughs> after the not decorating your house Japanese comment. <laughs> yeah, we're watching you, Sonny. We're watching you. <laughs> They corner the men before they're able to escape. The other man, Fujitsu, comes pulling up. There's a shootout. All three teams shoot at each other. A bunch of the Yakuza men get hit. They drive away. Fujitsu gives chase. No bullet holes in the Porsche because, you know, the lease won't let them. (laughs) Yeah, I know. (laughs) They're going to hold them to a tighter lease if there's bullet holes in it. (laughs) And Sunny finds the business card of, and it says that Fujitsu is a private dick from Tokyo. (laughs) Hey, that's what Sonny calls it, too. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I also want to point out how the Japanese PI not only saved them in the gun battle, then continued the police chase while Crockett was busy checking his car for scratches. <laughs> by the way, Kenji Fujitsu, played by Kiri Hiroyuki Tagawa. Sorry, yeah. Japanese people. I think I got that right. <laughs> I, I apologize. So, <laughs> so he's been in a few movies that you would probably know. Twins, Pearl Harbor, Planet of the Apes. I think it's the Marky Mark version. But mostly, I know him as Shang Tsung from Mortal Kombat. Oh, yes. yeah. Now I know. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. He also, he must have impressed in this episode because he had a regular role on season one of Nash Bridges. Oh. Ah, interesting. Sunny, Sunny has a... Or, Don Johnson yes, don't call has him. a tight group like that kind of follow him around all yeah. over the place. He, like, he tries to get people that he's worked with before on the shows and stuff he did. You can tell. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> over at the coroner's office, they're reviewing one of the dead men that the police didn't shoot, but another man shot that they're not investigating, who also, <laughs> as John said, continued the police chase yeah. when the police wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> and the tattoo, as Castillo identifies, is definitely Shirushi Gumi. So Castillo's got some deep knowledge of the Yakuza from his time in Vietnam. Has anyone Question seen mark? his body? No, I'm just Does he have it <laughs> yeah. in there somewhere? He's hiding it, isn't he? No. <laughs> yeah, so basically, he just starts reading the guy's tattoos like they're hieroglyphics. And I'm with you, Dom. He learned about the Yakuza in Vietnam? No, he was in Thailand. Okay. Oh, yeah, Thailand, yeah. like he's- Thailand. Yeah, that's he's where he in a stationed. different part of the world than where the Yakuza um, all, no, are. Okay. I was going to say, like, all the Asian <laughs> stuff just runs together, okay? You know? <laughs> Meanwhile, over at the gang headquarters, Tanaka's bodyguard, Agala, the man who killed Avery, too, tells a man that he disrespected the clan and he has no choice. The camera pans to the man, cutting off his own finger. That's the guy that stole the watch. <laughs> <laughs> You're out of the band, kid. Yeah. <laughs> we have a fast scene where Sonny's driving and talking to Caitlin about staying out all night and she's giving away his secret identity. It's not a secret anymore at this point, so I don't know why they even bother trying. <laughs> because it's a secret. <laughs> and now we go back to to the precinct. They're looking through pictures of known members of the gang. There's like on a it's like a PowerPoint of the gang, and, mm-hmm. and Castillo's like going into show. very deep detail about everyone and how the Yakuza works and, and how all the making individual jokes. gangs work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're making jokes. Well, Castillo is like an encyclopedia okay. knowledge of it. Yeah, I would be making jokes too. They're talking about Agawa, who's played by Danny Kamakona. Kamakona. He's had 32 TV appearances over the last 11 years. He's been in some movies, starting with Karate Kid 2, a lot of TV work. But the reason I'd be making jokes is because they the, they start off, when they start talking about him, is like, this is Agawa. He owns a chain of Japanese steakhouses. <laughs> Vasquez calls. He wants Haskell back on the case because it's been two days. Castillo just says, no way, man. There's no way. We need this uh, international incident. We need two more days. After Vasquez hangs up, I don't know what he's trying to say. Something like he's talking. He's saying like how I look on TV because he thinks this this is going to be international. He's going to be on mm, TV because they're going to ask him questions about it. And Hassel's like, I think pretty good. (laughs) Yeah, that and that's why he's saying like like. Can you get me on Ted Koppel? You know? <laughs> yeah, um, basically. So, and then basically leave, leave them with the threat of, if you can't get me on Ted Koppel, 
you guys are going to be uh, checking out men's rooms in South Beach for the next month. I mean, based on that one bus where they were posted up in the public bathroom at Miami Beach, like they may already spend significant time there. <laughs> but what's so wrong with the, the men's bathroom in, in the South Beach? Yeah. What's he trying to say? Yeah, what is he insinuating <laughs> there? <laughs> This whole episode is full of bigots. No, <laughs> so here's the plan. They're going to stick to the Yakuza, not look at Agawa specifically or Fujitsu specifically because they don't understand why. And they hint at and they do out the episode that you finally get it at the end that Fujitsu used to be part of this gang and now he's out of it. And they decide they're not going to investigate them, everyone independently, just stay on the Yakuza, stay on Tanaka. And then hopefully everything will come together. So let's talk about Gina and Trudy looking for work. <laughs> the ladies, this is what I was talking about, that they need to split up. They're going to attack multi-point attack. And of course, the ladies, they got to get into the stripper part of this because that's what they do. Um, have you seen Stan? He can never be a stripper. <laughs> he never make it. He gets booed off the stage <laughs> just for being Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> I love their demands in the meeting too. Like no kinky stuff, but we'll bring our own costumes. <laughs> they specifically say. I'm kind of curious what costumes those are. <laughs> you would be John. <laughs> the ladies, they're gonna work in there. They their fake accents are great. First of all, <laughs> I don't know what Gina. I don't doing. know what they're trying like, to do. What's, like, what, what is the, Gina trying to do? I <laughs> think like Jersey. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. And yeah. they spe specifically say no rough stuff, condoms only, and no employees. They look like, right <laughs> at the guy in the room with them like no employees. <laughs> specifically, you. <laughs> Definitely not that guy. <laughs> Outside. Fujitsu comes pulling up while also the duo are out there and Castillo and Switek, they're all watching. We have another stripper montage with Haskell inside of the club. And Agawa comes walking up and he's like, why are you here? You're not supposed to ever come here. But Haskell sees Trudy dancing on stage and he recognizes her as a cop and Haskell's dirty. Next thing we know, the two ladies are tied up upstairs inside of a bedroom with Haskell saying, why don't you give me 30 minutes alone with these two? Pervert. So how did they not see Haskell going into the club? Or has he just been there for like 12 hours? <laughs> <laughs> he was there before they got the jobs. So, you know, they couldn't see him. I mean, there, there's like in like eight different cars out front. Like, how does he get in there? to do that i don't know and i'm also wondering too with the ladies like how many times they've gone undercover as strippers or burlesque or hookers how many strip teases and one-on-ones and stuff have they given in their career a lot for being because they're undercover it, it, and they have to work clubs yeah you like, can't just be like i'm only gonna do this one then leave <laughs> it, it i got just, all the information i needed yeah it just hit me like a ton of bricks like what the men do and then the ladies are always being hook, hookers and strippers and stuff. That means that they've done some stuff that they don't ever want to talk about. Yep. Because yeah, they have many, to be in that situation. How many situation. handies has Gina given out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, I mean, they have to, they can't be like, hey, you're not the person I need the information from. I'm not going to give you anything because that person's going to go, well, I tried to pay them and they didn't want my money. <laughs> yeah. They can't be outed either because no. the people that they're going undercover with will kill them. Yeah, Exactly. So they've given a lot of stuff out. Yeah. A lot, a lot of people have seen those boobies. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Trudy's on stage. She's dancing on stage. She's not just like standing in the oh, corner no, I, well, I, I think they were trying to insinuate that Gina was somewhere too. We just didn't get to see her. Well, I know, but that's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's like she wasn't she just like strip. standing at the bar or something. She had to get up on stage and dance. <laughs> and now you're wondering why you've never seen it, huh? No. <laughs> Agawa's heard enough from Haskell. And he tells his men to go grab him. He's not happy that Haskell's there. Haskell's trying to say you owe me money. But Agawa doesn't care. And what does Haskell think he's going to do anyway? I don't know. Like, alone. He's, he's just trying to use it. He saw a vice cop while he was there trying to use that as leverage. But what if that vice cop wasn't there? What was his yeah. leverage then? <laughs> <laughs> so, meanwhile, while they're arguing with Haskell, freaking news shows up to their undercover sting. No one notices everything going on out front. Because the news shows up, Castillo gets out, cops are talking with the news, talking with each other. And this is all going <laughs> on right out front of the club while they're upstairs ar uh, uh, arguing about what to do with the vice cop. And then they hear on the radio, they turn on, that they're able to turn on, they hear that Haskell confirmed that he's dirty. They hear Agawa basically say that they that's why they killed Avery. Uh, and Vasquez is like, 
well, I guess Haskell's done. And then that's literally the end of the Vasquez Haskell story. That's it. Done. <laughs> Castillo has no one to answer to now. He doesn't have to worry about that. The ladies are tied up. They're in extreme danger. And Castillo says, we're not going to move. Not with everyone armed. Sonny and Tubbs, you guys go in. Which didn't make any sense to me because like, as soon as they come in with their badges, can't they radio, hey, like their cops are here and they just shoot them? And then they're dead. <laughs> they don't even do anything either. No, just go no. in. It's even the worse. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Tubbs and Crockett take the long way around because, <laughs> you know, they got to check out the strippers on their way through. <laughs> yeah. While they're taking the long way around, the Japanese PI badass ninja <laughs> Fujitsu kills or wipes out all the guards before they even get there. Leaves Haskell handcuffed. That way they're able to arrest him. Save the ladies and not have to actually do anything for it. Nope. P.I. does all the work and Vice gets all the credit. <laughs> Back at the precinct to do our talking, Castillo comes in. He hears, sorry, he has a file that says Avery was trying to stop a hostile takeover of his company. But they still don't know why Fujitsu has flipped and he's going against Tanaka. But they understand why they wanted to kill Avery now. And then later, Castillo is just chilling at his desk in total darkness. <laughs> he never goes home. He just sleeps there. Fujitsu comes walking in and Castillo's like, I know you're there. Why don't you just come have a seat? Like, let's chat, man. You know what? That's why he does all the creepy hanging out in doorways. It's because when he was in Thailand, that someone must do that there. Who <laughs> 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 just comes in, they sit, chit chat for a little bit. Hang Castillo out. <laughs> asks him a few questions, why he's rebelling, and Fujitsu says, what I've do you got? No, I'm I'm, <laughs> I don't want, I'm no commie, so that's uh, why yeah, I'm basically. fighting back against Tanaka. <laughs> yeah, then, Fujitsu t tells a whole story. Um, uh, uh, it, it, the story's boring. I'm not going to bore you. It's boring. <laughs> Long and boring. Everything's about a mutiny. This is a mutiny. So, <laughs> And then now it's sexy time as he's going to take off his shirt and Castillo's going to read his tattoos for him. <laughs> yeah, that's, he's like, okay, well, I only have one more thing to say. Open your shirt. <laughs> Whoa, okay, it got kind of weird in here now. Fujitsu says that he gave them Haskell and now he wants a favor. Now it's time to return the favor. So now we go to Tanaka's. And I don't know how any of this, because Castillo goes along with any of this. So, because Cast Castillo is strangely friendly with mysterious ninja types. <laughs> Do you remember that guy that was like living at his house with him? <laughs> he found out at the end of the episode, wasn't even the real guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we go to the final. This is where we're going to end the episode. We're at the Tanaka gang headquarters. Castillo goes to see Tanaka and he says, I heard you had problems with Haskell. I can help. Now that he's been arrested, I can help you out. I can give you Fujitsu. And then he leaves and Tanaka tells Agawa, I kill Fujitsu as soon as he gets here. Fast forward that night, that yeah, next it's day. That, it's that night. But he also says he doesn't want, Agawa says he doesn't want to do it. Like he's like, do I have to kill him? He's been such a good asset. And he's like, no, you know, we have to kill him because he basically brought him in. Agawa brought what's his name, Fujitsu yeah. into the gang and everything. So he's like, I don't really want to kill him. Do I have to? <laughs> <laughs> well, and this is what does it make sense is, is like they, he tells him to kill Fujitsu and the cop when they bring him in. And then our very next scene, he goes and talks with Fujitsu, who's like meditating. So like he didn't even wait for Castile to bring him in. In fact, Castile doesn't even get there. Until we're on, we're, we're in full on samurai sword fight mode. <laughs> yeah, well, I think what they're insinuating is that that's what, that's how he got him there. They, that's him there. That's why he knows he's down there meditating or whatever. Yeah, I don't know how any of this got set up, and I don't know what Castillo expected. He knew, like, based on how Fujitsu showed up, like, he was going to kill Agawa and Tanaka. That was his goal. Yeah, he was there to watch it. So he <laughs> set it up. Yeah. Agawa comes. They sword fight. <laughs> it's kind of like episode two Star Wars prequel level <laughs> sword fighting. So it's not the best, but it's okay. It's I mean, have you ever it's... sword fought? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's more of a sword fight montage. I would say that Fujitsu uh, definitely carries the fight. He is definitely <laughs> the more skilled 
actor I with don't... a sword. Hey, the other guy was in Karate Kid Part 2. How could be? <laughs> I saw him. He was doing the little drums. He was good at it. <laughs> <laughs> and just when Fujitsu is about to kill Agawa, Castillo stops him and tells him, don't do it because that'll give him an honorable death. Let him live in dishonor by going to jail. And so then they like go handcuffs on him and put him in the back of the car. Maybe. Uh, do they leave him handcuffed there because they get in the car and they drive down the street to go see Tanaka? Oh, I think they got in the car. I thought they just went inside. No, they drove. They, oh, okay. Because well, you see the car the, come pulling the up trunk. and they get out. Yeah. <laughs> like, hooked up in there. They, they got him somewhere. They, they handcuffed <laughs> him somewhere. He's like handcuffed to a bike rack somewhere or something. <laughs> <laughs> handcuffed and, into a hot dog cart. <laughs> and mostly you were one Miami. you were wondering too while we we're watching it it's like did castillo set this up so they could kill each other yeah i was like okay so we just want these people to die is that what he was just gonna watch <laughs> like he had to have been there way before so why didn't he try and stop it before it got that far first? <laughs> then there's like, what are they going to do know, with Tanaka? Kinda, like, how are they going to get Tanaka? It, well, and it starts to turn into like a buddy cop movie. As they come rolling up to the next place, they come hopping out. You know, him and Fujitsu, or the, the guy we assume is Fujitsu. We have no idea. <laughs> uh, he might be another imposter. <laughs> we don't verify. <laughs> so, but yeah, they're, and they're like, to, they like both have guns. This is like, it's like total buddy cop movie. By the way, brilliant flute work by Jan Hammer at the end here. <laughs> like, he just gets down with that pan flute. <laughs> so now Fujitsu is, so, yeah, he's he's Castillo's partner. He gives him a gun. They're going to go now uh, go arrest Tanaka, right? That's what Castillo is have him do, right? Arrest him, not kill Tanaka. Well, I mean, it's not his fault. He was trying to arrest him. <laughs> well, I know, but I'm saying it's yeah. like Fujitsu now was a Miami police officer, they right? They him. <laughs> yeah, he's going to go in there and arrest him. And then they're going to partner up with Fujitsu. Are they going to arrest Fujitsu for all the people he killed? Yes. And then they're going to get a dog as a sidekick. <laughs> <laughs> Every movie in the, mo- in the 80s with cops. <laughs> <laughs> they come in to Tanaka's room just in time to see that he's killing himself, stabs himself in the stomach slumps forward sunny and rico come running is that up. what he was doing yes <laughs> <laughs> he, he was he was killing him. i thought he was like trying to remove his appendix it's like probably like a how-to you know like who needs hospitals he had bad clams that oh, was what it was <laughs> also three police officers and a private investigator do not run to him and try and stop the bleeding <laughs> no, and save him or, or try to stop him, him at all die. yeah like castillo's face is like eh, whatever we tried what? we got here why are tubs and crockett even there uh, essentially castillo is going renegade with with his uh new buddy like, why are when did they call tubs and crockett and why None i think of this they were there all along <laughs> <laughs> Fujitsu says that the Yakuza have their own justice. They stare at the dead body. The end. That's it. <laughs> That's the end of the episode. <laughs> Who knows what's going to happen to Fujitsu? I, I have a feeling he's going to room with Castillo for a few more days <laughs> and then he's going to catch a fight back to Japan. They're going to go out on the beach when their Speedo's on and look <laughs> at the water. <laughs> <laughs> this is another Vice episode that did really well. It just couldn't stick the landing. Yeah, it could have been so much better if they had a better, land- yeah. better landing. <laughs> better ending. <laughs> landing, ending, whatever. Uh-huh. They were on the uneven bars. They did a great routine. Triple flip off the high bar, broke their leg on the landing. <laughs> no, they just, on the landing, they stepped. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Collapsed into a heap, waited for their coach to come scoop them up. So I have a few more final thoughts on this. Most of them pertain to the third act. In this and ha- from the time when Haskell, they just stopped talking about Haskell <laughs> until the time they fail to save a man <laughs> as he lays there bleeding. <laughs> uh. <laughs> but let's go talk about this week's music. There's some names in here you might recognize and one that Melissa's very excited about. Yes. <laughs> let's go talk about this week's music. All right, John, there's actually a fair amount of music in here and a fair amount of Jan Hammer music uh, and with some bands that we've seen before. So what do you got for us this week? OK, so we're going through uh, we're going to run through some of the music pretty quick because we get Flesh for Fantasy from Billy Idol, who we have already seen in Down for Count. 
Down for the Count Part 2, and he's going to be back again for Honor Among Thieves. We've already talked about him. I told you that he was almost T-1000. Told you about him being in The Wedding Singer. I don't know what more you want me to tell tell you about <laughs> Billy Idol. So we'll see if I figure anything out by Honor Among Thieves. We also have C si Senor the Harry Grill. <laughs> it's one of my favorite song names ever. Yes. In case you missed that, that was C si Senor the Harry Grill. A yellow. <laughs> they also also did the song Moon and Ice. Sadly, this is the last appearance of Yellow in our music. You might remember them from the episodes Kill Shot, Contempt of Court, a Swiss electronica and techno pop band. They consisted of Dieter Moyer, Boris Blank, and Carlos Peron. Carlos Peron, being the original member, him and Boris Blank, founded Transonic Records in Zurich when they founded the group Yellow. They would bring in Dieter Moyer uh, to... Uh, take o- to basically head up vocals, and Perone would actually leave shortly after that. We've talked about them a little bit, and so I have always enjoyed the the their name of their band, Yellow. I love the name, Si Senor, the Hairy Girl. <laughs> so we bid you adieu. <laughs> so let's get to what you guys really want to hear about. Last night I dreamt that someone loved me by the Smiths. Smiths are an English band who were active from 1982 to 1987. They are made up of Stephen Patrick Morrissey, Johnny Marr, Andy Rourke, and Mike Joyce. In 1982, Johnny Marr basically showed up on Morrissey's doorstep with his friend Steve Pomfret. They showed up on his doorstep to see if he wanted to start a band together. They really didn't really know each other, but he was... Marr was impressed by Morrissey's... Morrissey had written a book on the band The New York Dolls, Mm -hmm. and he was a fan. And so he went to his house and asked him, hey, you want to start a band? Morrissey, uh, Stephen, as we'll talk... uh, I think it should be... We're getting to know him. We can call him (laughs) Stephen. So Marr and Stephen basically spent the first few years of the band releasing demos and singles. They did a couple shows, but mostly were just basically still trying to get the rest of the band worked out as Steve Steve Pomfret would leave and they would have a few other people tried out as drummers and bassists before settling on uh, Rourke and Joyce. By 83, they determined on the name The Smiths. They said that they chose the name because it was the most, basically the most ordinary name they could think of. And by 1983, Morrissey had forbidden anyone to call him Stephen. Just going by Morrissey. <laughs> this sounds this this all sounds based on how I know Morrissey now. That's exactly and how he is. Exactly yeah. how he is. Yeah. <laughs> so in 1984, their debut album, The Smiths, reached number two on U- UK album charts, and that really was the beginning of the popularity. They were met with some controversy off of the first record, with some no. tabloids claiming that song suggested pedophilia. <laughs> No, wait Primarily a minute. Primarily these songs, Are you Reel Around the Fountain and The Hand That Rocks the Cradle. <laughs> Are you suggesting that Morrissey and the Smiths and Controversy? <laughs> There's no way I saw that coming. Yeah, Morrissey <laughs> being who he is and a vegetarian. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you guys can call him Stephen, too. We, we can go... <laughs> It's okay. No, I don't Steven. think so. He's Morrissey. He's not Stephen. <laughs> so, in, in 1985, Meet is Murder came out. It was more a more strident and political album, obviously, with uh, the main song, Meet is Murder, being a very pro-vegetarian <laughs> title track. Yep. Uh, Stephen, Stephen would go on to forbid the band from being photographed eating meat. <laughs> so Stephen said, no more eating meat, uh, at least while cameras are present. <laughs> yeah, I don't care what you do in your house. Just don't eat it in public. <laughs> so late 85, 86, the release The Queen is Dead came out. They were constantly touring and it was starting to take a toll. Uh, Mar had talked in interviews about how he they were touring so much and he- so burnt out that he was drinking excessively. They also had a legal dis- with their record label at the time, which released release of 
the uh, album from late 85 to June 86, and all kinds of just shenanigans within the band, Rourke would actually be fired via post-it. <laughs> um, <laughs> For, uh, apparently for his heroin use. Well, I mean, that is a serious but only for about two weeks. <laughs> but only for about two weeks. After two weeks, he would rejoin the band and his replacement would be moved to guitars and eventually leave the band. Obviously, Steven still still claims that that never happened, but Rourke <laughs> does. So... <clears throat> Well, then it's a lie. Then. <laughs> <laughs> if Morrissey said it didn't happen, then it didn't happen. Steven. His name no, is Steven. No, Morrissey. <laughs> Steven Patrick. <laughs> so by 1987, um, tensions had grown a lot. Uh, Maura had taken a sabbatical from the band, which prompted articles about a possible split up. It just created, made tensions worse. So by the time their album Strange Ways Here We Come was released in 87, the band had already split up. The claim was is that Steven didn't like that Marr was working with other musicians, while Marr disliked Steven's inflexibility musically. <laughs> so, um, Steven, Steven clearly being jealous of Marr wanting to expand musically and work with other people. <laughs> Steven clearly so, being the talent. <laughs> 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 well, that that's arguable, because post-Smiths, once the Smiths broke up, Steven will go on to have a successful solo career, so I'll give you that. Under the name Morrissey, but we know him as Steven here. <laughs> the rest of the world knows him as Morrissey, you know. <laughs> but while he was doing his solo career, Mar wasn't exactly just stagnant. He's successful himself. He would release three albums from 89 to 93 in the super group Electronic. He was also a member of the band The The <laughs> during that same period of time. Uh, and he was also working as a session musician. And he did work. He worked and recorded with bands like The Pretenders, Beck, The Talking Heads, and a number of others. He also joined the Modest Mouse from 2006 to 2007, mm. toured extensively with them. So, and then after all of that, most recently, he's been releasing his own solo stuff and finding some success. I don't know. Steve might not be the most successful post more. Um, I think he is. <laughs> well, you know, he still sells on concerts, so I guess you know so by himself, more... not with another band or uh, with Modest Mouse, but all alone. <laughs> hey, I'm just saying, Modest Mouse is a massive band. I mean, they could even be bigger than. Okay, let's wrap this up. <laughs> yeah, right. Um... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So Rourke and Joyce were they were they were in numerous other bands, but um, none saw uh, anywhere close to the success the Smiths were did. But they would sue Morrissey and Marr in 1989 because apparently the money was not split up very fairly. Mm -hmm. You see, the problem with joining a band and being in the band is that eventually someone has to talk money. And when no one talks money, well, what happens is after you leave the band, you realize that Johnny Marr and Morrissey were each getting 40% of the revenue, a total yeah, of 80% yeah. of the band's revenue. <laughs> yep. Wow. And Rourke and Joyce were each only getting 10% of, <laughs> of what the band made. They would sue, and Rourke would, because of financial issues, would settle almost immediately. He would walk away with 83,000 pounds, which is, I mean, that, that's what, like $1,000 in US money? <laughs> $420. <laughs> So, and then he would go on to collect just 10% of future revenue. So he would stay at the 10% and walk away for just $80,000. Joyce, who was doing a little bit better, who was also doing some session work, doing a little bit better financially, continued to sue. The, uh, the case would go on for years, but he would eventually win. He would be awarded 1 million pounds and 25% of future revenue. No. So, and <laughs> because Stephen would would forget to make some payments, he would actually end up receiving a million and a half pounds. Mm. Um, getting some late fees out of old Morrissey there. <laughs> so, but all in all, it wouldn't settle until 1998. That's that's nine years, folks. 
Wow. Ten years illegal. Numerous times people have speculated. People have tried to pay them to reunion. There was even one claim that someone tried to give them fifty million dollars to do like four shows. Every time they have turned it down, and every time they have said, or specifically, uh, Stephen and Mar have said that it's not about the money. Because obviously, for Rourke and Joyce, it would be very much yeah, about exactly. the money. Because they have money. <laughs> They would be more than happy to reunite. But yeah, <laughs> Morrissey and Marr would say no every time. They would say it wasn't about the money. Morrissey even once saying in an interview that he would rather eat his own testicles than <laughs> reform the Smiths. And that's saying that. something for a vegetarian. Exactly. <laughs> so don't expect any new Smith music soon. I, I think they worked out some... To release some compilations, but that was mostly because I think Roy, Rourke and Joyce reached out and was like, come on, guys, we need the cash. Please, we need the money. <laughs> so, there you have it. The Smiths, starring Johnny and Steven. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, have, I have two points here that I'll make on this final music wrap-up. One, Melissa, this is your heyday. This is when The Smiths, The Cure, yes. and Depeche Mode are all like at their biggest. Yep, exactly. Um, and I'm sure there's several times where you can see like they were touring either at the, together or in the same areas at the yeah. same time. Especially because they're all from kind of the same part of England, mm -hmm. too. So this is like your heyday. Two, John, I'm not protecting you. Morrissey will come for your ass. <laughs> yeah, actually, he will. <laughs> <laughs> he will. You're better. Hey, if I didn't get sued, if, if I didn't get sued by that guy who basically sued everyone that ever wrote anything about him, he even sued that critic. Like, if he hasn't come after me, I'm not scared of you, Stephen Patrick. <laughs> Well, I just have one point to make. While you were while you were finishing up, I was looking up their net worth. So, for what it's worth, Morrissey's worth fifty million dollars. And the other guy, yeah, he's worth two point five million. So I think maybe hey, if you're talking hey. money, who's more successful? Fifty million is a I, lot more millions than two point five. I am still, I am still <laughs> Team Johnny Marr over here. Marr yeah, was well, right. <laughs> all I know, John, is that Morrissey will drag your ass on Twitter. Yeah, he will. He does it all the time. I follow him. <laughs> well, let's go find Warwick. <laughs> to Gork, Gork would agree with me. <laughs> well, let's go give our final thoughts on this episode of Miami Vice. A, a nice comeback, I'll say, from last week. So <laughs> let's go yeah. give our final thoughts. All right, Melissa, why don't you kick off this week? Last week, we had like a hurricane where Sonny gets married. This week, we don't even mention the wedding or anything. We have Caitlin for a little bit, but... You know, it's like it never happened. Thank God for that. <laughs> I can pretend like it didn't happen. <laughs> um, I like this episode. I I don't like that there isn't. I wish they had more back, like obviously more like in depth with Castillo. Like, how does he know all this stuff? Like, how does he really understand all this stuff and know? They don't ever tell you. It's just like he just knows because he was in Asia once. He just knows the entire <laughs> continent. I know. He yeah. knows because he's got an Asian speedo at home, and it's, you know he's got it. <laughs> he knows because he's a ninja. He's got yeah. ninja ways. <laughs> Uh, I mean, like I said, I, I would love it if there was more on that. Um, it does fall flat. It doesn't really make any sense. I don't understand why they even have Pascal and Vasquez in it if they're not going to close it out. But I guess they need to get in there somehow. <laughs> <laughs> it is lacking uh, tubs. Lacking tubs big time. Like, I mean, he's in there, but he doesn't say anything. They give Crockett all the lines. And even then, it's not, Crockett's not in it much either. So I don't know what was going on with that. Like, why? Yeah, but Crockett doesn't like Japanese people. <laughs> <laughs> well it made it seem like Tubbs made is that like pretty Japanese clear. people <laughs> Tubbs is like I don't want to talk about this I don't want to be involved I just I don't know I was disappointed that Tubbs is not in it as much as I would like I like Tubbs I want Tubbs to be in everything <laughs> with his beard <laughs> John, what are your final thoughts? So I agree with you, Melissa. I would have loved to see some good old Castillo flashbacks to his time <laughs> in uh, Thailand or whatever, where he got his Yakuza tattoo reading skills. <laughs> um, he took a class. It was at the Y. <laughs> I think I know what, what happened. See, because it was building up like it was going to be a great episode. Even though the plot didn't always make sense, but that comes with your Vice episodes. The problem is, is that it is that we are used to these ending in big gun battles. 
was building up for this big ninja showdown at the end where it was just going to be I was expecting ninjas to be jumping out of the ceilings and <laughs> and gun uh, Crockett and Tubbs are, are, are shooting and, and killing off Yakuza as Castile's running around with a sword you know <laughs> oh god um, that would have been but it was very no. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was very anticlimactic because at the end the guy just kind of stabs himself as they walk in so I mean aside from that one little samurai sword fight we didn't get the 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 ninja shootout at the end that i think we were all expecting you know the vice fashion ends in the shootout and this is the one time we didn't get the shootout where i think we really wanted the shootout yeah i would agree with all of that like it's just it falls flat at the end but it was building to be a really good episode and in total it is a good episode like they they there's crime and there's murder and there's no drugs, which is okay because there was like the hooker angle in this. That's <laughs> how they hookers. Did. <laughs> that makes up for it. You got to see Trudy in a negligee. That was <laughs> close enough. <laughs> that was good, right? I mean, <laughs> but it was a good episode. It's it it did fall flat at the end, but it's okay. Like we're we're recovering. It's like we had a really bad <laughs> sports injury in the last two weeks. Got to be gentle. <laughs> To like a hurricane and now we're we're gonna get our stride again next week we got sunny infiltrating a video dating service so like you know we're like getting back into the stride of things here we're, we're the horse that got out of step yes. and now we're starting to get our stride again so this was a pretty good episode the only thing that really stood out to me and this isn't vice this is america in the 80s is they were they tried to be so careful to like give Japanese people and Asian people respect in this episode by making it all about honor and duty and they're a very tight knit gang that that had all these rules and mm-hmm. everything they were that as a as an episode they're trying to be so careful to like try and treat Japanese people with respect and it comes off so racist. Yes, it does. It really does. But that was their way of doing it then. That, mm-hmm. that's, that's... And this isn't the first Vice episode where it's been that <laughs> no. way and it's definitely not the only TV show I've seen since 1980 where this is how it is when they do the asian episodes and then castillo is able to walk us through by telling us like this is how they operate yeah. and it's all this honor and history that goes along with it and all this stuff to try and justify them doing some pretty skeptical racist stuff yeah throughout the episode and like i was saying this isn't a vice thing this is an 80s thing and it's just like a, a, a mm-hmm. signpost along the TV's history it's, about how this used to yeah. be done. I think it's more of a sign of what society was like back then. That it would been that would have been totally acceptable, and that would have been a respectful episode about an Asian kimonos. Yeah, and yeah. They, they got to have sake, yeah. and they got to do all this other stuff. And Crockett's got to talk about how he doesn't like Japanese <laughs> style houses. And so this is just, it's just an observation of mine about Asian culture in on TV in the eighties. Well, that's going to do it for this episode, but we are going to introduce a new section here. Bup, 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 bup. Some transfer music <laughs> that goes like here. Some transformers. Bup, 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 bup. Let's check the mailbag. We got an email to read. And the reason why I picked this one out is because he makes a great point. This email is from Robert. He says, hey, guys, I'm Robert. Big Miami Vice fan. Lo- lo- love the podcast. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> he says, I just finished watching the series. I won't spoil the series finale for you because I know you're watching it blind, but have some tissues handy, Melissa. Yes. <laughs> I already know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you guys have talked about the, the series to do after Vice. I would recommend not straying far from Vice Family and doing Crime Story. I'm one is, for that. <laughs> yeah, we've talked about this. Mm. We've talked about Crime Story. He says, I just watched a two-hour pilot and it's like watching Vice on a different level. You're waiting for Crockett and Tubbs to show up and of course they never do. But in true Michael Mann fashion, just as Vice, there's a huge shootout towards the end with no bystanders getting hit. <laughs> <laughs> the show was filled with Vice regulars, even Izzy. I know. I didn't know that. That's exciting. Mm-hmm. I will say, at least after watching the pilot, the show seems quite a bit darker than Vice and it has almost no humor. A lot like season three of Vice, except you have to watch the episodes in order, no jumping around. Just my two cents, I would expect the Vice podcast to continue if the reboot starts this year or whenever. And that's from Robert, as I mentioned. And absolutely, if Vice does a reboot, we're back. Oh, yeah, for we sure. We are on board oh, yeah. for the Vice reboot. You can't see me from watching it. so. <laughs> and we had a nice exchange uh-huh. back, back and forth, Robert and I. We talked a little bit more about what the potential storyline is for the new Vice. We talked about... Crime story a little bit. One of the other shows that we mentioned that we might want to do is 21 Jump Street because it fits that cop and music kind of thing together. But, John, I know you're you're not on the opposite side of the fence on 21 Jump Street. I am. Is that because uh, like, you're not allowed I, I, in school zones? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you try and pretend to be a high school student once, and you know, <laughs> and, and then the young random ever. It works in the movies. Why couldn't I go undercover? Richard no, Greco, I'm not really a cop. get the fuck out of here. What are you doing here, Richard, Richard Greco? You're like 50. Get out of here. <laughs> Hey, it only worked when Johnny did it, okay? <laughs> so at, in my exchange with Robert, it came up with, I think, how we're going to do this. And, and we're going to talk more about this. But I believe this summer, what we're going to do is, is we're going to do some pilots. We're going to give the vice treatment to a series of shows, like pilots for those shows. We'll release them in a separate feed, may, probably on our Patreon. Uh, maybe on YouTube is where we'll release them. They won't be put into the regular vice RSS feed. Or the they go with the heat feed. We'll do it as something separate, but then we'll be able to do the vice treatment on them. We'll get our feet wet. We'll get some feedback from the listeners and see which ones that they prefer. Crime story is pretty strong. Not only is it Michael Mann and has crossover with Miami Dennis Vice, Dennis Farina, Dennis Farina, but it's mm-hmm. also only two seasons long, so we can actually get through that pretty quickly. I love that show, so I'm okay. <laughs> to check out the music so yeah look for this summer in the next couple months we'll start to solidify our plans around that we'll do a few pilots and do the go with the heat treatment on them release them out and then get some feedback on them we'll see where we want to go when we get to the end of this year so thank you robert for emailing i really appreciate you sending feedback and the nice exchange that we had going back and forth i thought that went really well and i really appreciate hearing from you so thanks for emailing we would love to hear your feedback too. Email us go with the heat at gmail.com, just like Robert did. Get us on Twitter, twitter.com slash go with the heat, Facebook.com slash go with the heat. You know where we're at. You know how to get a hold go of us. Go with the heat. <laughs> <laughs> Even on Instagram, go with the heat. You want to see some choice pictures of Tubbs and his carrot juice <laughs> <laughs> from like a hurricane? Check out that Instagram, go with the heat. Be sure to check out the website, go with the heat.com. You can see all the ways to subscribe. Other ways you want to give us feedback, you can find additional RSS feeds, including the This Week in Vice only. You can find the music segment only. Be sure to ch- check out that website. That's going to do it for us And this by week. the way, Smiths fans, I didn't mean it. I'm sorry. Don't <laughs> at me. Please don't you send me be, letters. You should be apologizing to Morrissey. His ears were twitching right now. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm sorry, guys. I was just playing. <laughs> That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals. Bye.